Hello, everyone, and welcome to another great episode of the Golden Knowledge Podcast. Happy Friday. It's Friday, February 25th. It's, I'm glad to see you guys here at the live. If you're not catching this live, thank you for at least watching this podcast episode. I'm your host, Pat Foss. My guest today is a very, very esteemed guest. I'm so glad to have him on the podcast. He has a PhD in the history of philosophy from Columbia University. He's published philosopher and historian, specializing in contemporary philosophy of naturalism and in Greco-Roman philosophy, science, religion, and the origins of Christianity. It's Dr. Richard Carrier. Doctor, how are you? Hey, I'm doing good. So glad to have you. And, and today's episode, I did want to, and I tease this with a lot of my listeners, a lot of my viewers, so they know there are a lot of people that are atheists like myself who are absolutely uh, excited and ready for this episode to, to get underway. So what we have is the historicity of Jesus and also the historicity of the Bible itself. So we're going to start with the Bible, okay? Um, yeah. Kind of give us a, a little bit of an overview, and I was wondering... I, I wanted to originally start with the Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. A lot of people or a lot of theists that I've spoken to have said, you know, those are historical characters, they existed, and a lot of people that are more leaning, I guess, fundamental Christian would say that those characters wrote those books. Uh, what do you have to say about, about the Gospels? Yeah, uh, so that's a good place to start, uh, because uh, if you look at even like mainstream scholars, uh, Bart Ehrman, for example, is very popular. Uh, I still recommend his book, Jesus Interrupted. Uh, it is the best book that summarizes the current state of what is the consensus view of mainstream scholarship today on, on the New Testament, which is you know, the new half of the Bible. Uh, for the Old Testament, which is a whole, we, a whole other show, um, there's The Bible Unearthed by Silberman and Finkelstein uh, is the best book that I recommend people read because it, it shows you what mainstream scholars think about the Old Testament. They don't think a lot of that is historical either. Um, but when we get to the New Testament, uh, even Bart Ehrman will, will point out that uh, there's, there's no mainstream scholars who think that the names that are assigned to the Gospels we have today are the people who wrote them, or that the people who wrote them were witnesses of any sort. Uh, in fact, they, they even claim not to be in some cases, like Luke outright says he's not an eyewitness to these things. Um, John's, the, uh, what we have, the current redaction of John, now the mainstream Johannine scholarship is that we have the third redaction. There have been multiple authors who keep changing John. So there were earlier versions of John that was in a different order, had different contents and so on. Our version of John uh, has a section in it where it says we used some prior writing of this unnamed eyewitness. So even they are not claiming to be the witness themselves. Um, now that claim is also bogus. We're pretty sure that was attacked on later that there was no such thing. Um, so the mainstream scholarship agrees that, that these were not written by eyewitnesses. Uh, these are highly mytho mythologized treatises. They agree that these are myths about Jesus. Um, and that's different from saying that Jesus himself is a myth. You, you can have a historical person uh, around which all kinds of stories get made up, uh, right? So, and that's the mainstream view right now is that the gospel Jesus didn't exist. The gospel Jesus is a made up character. The mainstream most common consensus view is that that made up character is loosely based on a real person uh, that existed at one point. Uh, and it would be similar to the way Rastafarianism today um, bases their Bible. They have their own, uh, basically their own gospels and stuff off of the real Rastafari, who is the, uh, of royalty in Ethiopia. He was a real man who even disavowed being the Messiah and like telling them, well, I'm not your Messiah. Stop saying this. Uh, completely disavowed everything. And yet they, they go on preaching the same mythical tales that they've told about him. The mythical tales are bogus. The man is real. Um, and so the, the, that kind of thing uh, is, is what we're talking about uh, with the mainstream view of the New Testament. It, it's pretty much agreed that the Gospels are mythological. And then the debate then becomes how much of it can you even recover his history? The one thing I notice you keep saying is mainstream view. I notice you yeah. keep naming that. So thanks for what, asking about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, 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 I, I have, I have to, because yeah, you, no, it's, you, it's you, you bring it up into my head and you say mainstream. So are you not considering yourself mainstream? And if not, how do you differ from said mainstream? Yeah. Uh, so my position, which on specifically the history of city of Jesus, which we haven't gotten to yet, uh, isn't yet mainstream, right? It's, it is a new proposal within the field um, that is still undergoing examination, basically. Um, so, but what I mean when I say mainstream, I mean not fundamentalist, uh, scholars who have not sworn a doctrinal statement where they swear to never disagree with particular doctrines. Um, 
and I'm talking about scholars who actually do secular scholarship, even if they themselves are not secular, that they themselves do meet the standards of secular scholarship. So mainstream means most of the scholars who are doing real scholarship and are not committed to a dogmatic faith position. Uh, and Bart Ehrman is a good example of that, but there are also Christian believers uh, who fall into this category uh, of different types, who, who follow mainstream rules and do actual objective scholarship. Um, it, Raymond Brown would be an example of this. I mean, he's the late Raymond Brown now, but he was a, a devout, devoted Catholic scholar. But in his works, he very clearly demarcates and says, well, there's a difference between my faith beliefs and what I can prove historically. And he he makes these things clear. And he did these really extended books on the birth and death of Jesus, where he admits like most of it's uh, from the standards of secular history, from the standards of mainstream history, it's mostly myth, it's mostly made up stuff. Uh, and, and the virgin birth is a classic example. This is historically, this is not believable. Um, I, I have a personal faith belief in it, but I have to keep distinct, he says, his faith beliefs, which are not based on historical methods and what you can prove with historical methodology. So even Raymond Brown would fall, qualify as a mainstream scholar, despite being a devout Catholic. Uh, so when I talk about mainstream, I mean people who are, who are committed to that actual objective historical reasoning uh, and, and aren't uh, basically in the pocket of big fundamentalism uh, and, and Christian apologetics and so on. I wonder with your studies and, and, and really being a historian and philosopher, what is it that or excuse me, that's not the question. How long did it take for you to, because I know there was a, a video out there as well of you giving a lecture, I think it's to Atheists United. And that is uh, mm -hmm. about, you know, did Jesus really exist, right? And we're going to get to that in a minute, but I just want to get to kind of an overview of how long did that take to put that work together in order for you to present that in front of Atheists United? Oh, gosh, yeah, it's a long story. Six years, really, technically, um, because Atheist United actually put together and uh, resourced the grant that funded my postdoc research. Um, and so from the time that that grant was funded to when I completed the project, it was six years, resulting in two books, multiple peer reviewed journal articles, and so on. So a lot of work came out of that. Um, at the time that that started, I was kind of an agnostic about the historicity of Jesus because I had seen some good challenges. I'd seen a lot of bad challenges, really terrible challenges to the historicity of Jesus. And for when I was in grad school, for most of my time as a historian, I was very much adamantly against the idea that Jesus didn't exist. So I was on the side of the historicists and would basically make fun of these amateur arguments and point out how it's, it's just bad scholarship. There, there's no reason to re reject the consensus of, about the historicity of Jesus. So I was very much a pro-historicist scholar. Uh, and then I read Earl Doherty's book and then I was like, well, all right, that's his book, The Jesus Puzzle, presents like the most plausible case against the historicity of Jesus. I wasn't persuaded, but I was like, well, it's a, I haven't heard a good argument against what he's saying yet, right? So I was like, well, I leave it as an open question now. I would very be curious to know like what really holds up if you really dug into it. And so um, a variety of atheist donors through Atheist United actually funded uh, my research and said, find out, like spend the serious, you know, do a dissertation level work on this and see what comes out on the other side. And so I did, and I, I tried really hard to find the best case possible uh, to make the most provable version of the historical Jesus and find the best evidence for it. Uh, and what I found was the contrary, that all the evidence fell apart when you started looking at it. Uh, and, and that's after getting rid of all the bad arguments. There's tons of bad arguments against the historicity of Jesus. I chucked them all, but what's left over is still, still strong enough. And so uh, and I, what resulted was the first ever peer-reviewed book, well, at least in the last hundred years, the first peer-reviewed book by a major biblical studies press arguing that actually it's possible Jesus didn't exist. Uh, and here's why. And meeting the standards of mainstream scholarship. So it does meet the standards of mainstream scholarship. Now it's just a question of whether we can persuade mainstream scholars, which requires them to actually read the book, uh, at which most of them have not done. So you really can't cite their opinion yet. Uh, until they've actually done, you know, checked it. Like this is basically a challenge, a mainstream challenge to the mainstream consensus. The question now is, are they going to like evaluate that challenge or ignore it? Uh, and and I what we've seen so far is that there's a lot of scholars who are actually at least agreeing now that it's plausible that Jesus didn't exist. We're, we're seeing the number continually tick up year after year. So well, now I'm wondering. Now I have to ask a question before I ask about historicity of Jesus. So we really hit the main subject so you can just take yeah. it and run with it. Um, I, I will ask you this. So I have a good friend, Karsten, who is a, a Christian apologist, right? But he went to school to study how to do that. And I'm wondering, 
I'm wondering, not that it's a waste of time. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily in, in, in that sense, especially for him, but I would say for Christian apologists or, or any kind of apologist, really, for that matter, what is it that you feel maybe they're getting in the way of or getting wrong when it comes to trying to debate with someone like an atheist or someone like you that's a historian? Uh, where is it that you find that they kind of tangle themselves up a bit? Well, so it depends what school, what college, right? So what school are they going to? So what are they being taught, uh, right? So if they're going to a, like a mainstream, like a standards college, uh, you know, a Bridget, religious studies or history department or something like that, um, you're going to get a different kind of training than if you go to like, uh, you know, the, a fundamentalist school, a school that has particular doctrinal requirements for their professors, for instance. Um, so you're going to get different kind of training. In an apologetics training, you, what you're taught is how to rationalize a position you already hold. When you go to like a real, uh, like you know, a genuine religious studies department that doesn't have that faith commitment, that's actually gonna teach you objective methodology. What you do is the, the goal there is to challenge and test your prior beliefs, right? It, rather than to defend them. Like that's not the point of it. The point of it is to see like, actually you, now you have the skills to skeptically and critically evaluate what, you, what you've been told and, and what you believe and so on, and then actually find out what the real truth is. And so that methodology is based on looking at what the truth is rather than trying to defend a pre-decided dogma. Uh, and so that's that's the key difference between apologetics training and training in history. Uh, and and that you can see that play out in the way they act. So uh, a good example is for this particular issue, you'll have, and this happens almost all the time, I very few exceptions to this rule, uh, is when I'm arguing with a Christian or a Christian wants to argue with me, they haven't even read my book. Like they didn't even read it. They just come at me with all of these presuppositions that they have from the armchair to try and defend the historicity of Jesus. And I'm saying, well, I, I'm aware of all of those. I, I spent six years on a postdoc research project checking out those claims. Like, so, so go to the book and see what my results were. You know, I've already answered all of those arguments. Go read the book and then come back and let's argue what's in the book. Let's what I've actually argued under peer review in the scholarly field. Uh, apologetics, apologists, they just want to defend the position. They don't want to do any research uh, that might challenge their views. And if they do, they just skim, right? They'll just skim the book, but they don't actually read it. Uh, they're not taking it seriously as a challenge that they need to uh, really look at. Uh, whereas historians, when you look at historians, uh, they'll either outright say, oh, I don't have time to read the book, so I'm not really interested. Or they will actually read the book and actually have like considered statements to make. Like They'll show that they know what the arguments are in the book. And so that is, I think, the key difference you've got to look for is, are they willing to do the work? Are they gonna look at the latest peer reviewed literature and actually pay attention to it, not just skim it, not just rage blog it, uh, but but actually like read it and take it seriously uh, as an actual viable theory that they need to uh, think about critically. Uh, and that's true, it's not just my book now. So we have two books that argue for the, at least the agnosticism towards the historicity of Jesus. Uh, my book came out in 2014 on the historicity of Jesus. Uh, and then Letaster, Raphael Letaster came out with a book uh, on questioning the historic, historicity of Jesus. Um, so we have two now peer and his is, you know, also by a major uh, academic press. So we have two peer reviewed monographs challenging the historicity of Jesus, both by PhDs in relevant fields. Uh, and so it's it's time to start taking this argument seriously and actually going and looking at these books, like actually reading them so you understand what the arguments are and why we're taking this position. One thing that I notice is is what you said is that a lot of people will just be armchair readers or skimmers. And I noticed that a lot of people did that also with with one of my or last week's uh, interview, which was Dr. Lawrence Krauss that I had on the show. And we were talking right. all things physics. And uh, I noticed that people like like Dinesh D'Souza and others, when they come out, <laughs> it, well, yeah, and I hate to use that as yeah, an example. No, but, I, it's a good example. Yeah. <laughs> but as an example of, well, here I'm holding up a universe from nothing. And I think I know what it means and what it even says. And I'm just going to quote a few lines out of your book totally take them out of context and not give any context right. really behind them. So for you, how, how many debates have you been in that roundabout that you have had someone do that? Like you said, with an armchair, you know, just, just skimming. I honestly have, I've lost count. Like you even, I've lost count, even peer reviewed academic reviews of my books do this. Right. Uh, and, and in fact, I just, um, Letaster and myself, uh, just did a video or a couple of videos on this for uh, the GCRR. Um, you can find uh, the um, oh, you can find it on my website, but you go look for the GCRR 
conference, the latest one where we, we did talks about the reception of the historicity question in recent scholarship. And we, we go through examples of, of exactly how they'll say one thing and it shows that they didn't even read the book, right? Because they're saying things that are already answered in the book or things that aren't in the book, uh, right? So this kind of misrepresentation is sort of uh, not, not taking it seriously and not doing the work is common. Uh, it's so common that it's frustrating, uh, honestly. And and yeah, I know that happens with with Krauss. And, and one of my criticisms has been of uh, Lawrence Krauss's book uh, about nothing. Um, it isn't that he's wrong. It's rather that uh, he sort of didn't anticipate that they were going to do this, right? So uh, so he made it too easy for them to misquote what he's arguing in the book. Um, whereas if he'd had just a couple paragraphs acknowledging their position and explaining why he's moving on to a different position, uh, then he would have a much bigger beef when they ignore those paragraphs and say, hey, you know what? I just proved you ignored two paragraphs in my book. Uh, and when they do that, like you mentioned some examples of when they do that, and you can catch them actually just ignoring the context of a statement. Uh, that that's, that's golden. I think that's really crucial for audiences to see that because then they know that these people who are making these arguments are not reliable. They're not actually honestly engaging with the argument and which kind of like eliminates them as authorities in this debate. And, and so it deeply hurts their, uh, their authority uh, and, and any respect that we can tend to their position. And so that it's, it's important to craft things. I think, I think Krauss could have done a better job to craft his book to trap them that way. Um, but nonetheless, uh, they still do it, right? It doesn't, even, if you, even if you think ahead and actually include all of that stuff, uh, they still will ignore it and claim things are in your book that aren't in your book or that you said things you didn't say, right? So, um, this is a common problem and, and yeah, you have to constantly deal with it, but call it out every time you see it. I'm wondering, and, and what would be your solution? Do you think that even a, a base starting point to a solution of how do we start to help eliminate that? Because I've heard people say different answers. I won't give answers because I don't want to leave the question or leave the answer, but um, I've heard different answers before from different people that are scientists that are historians um, saying, how do we eliminate this problem of misquoting, misinformation being spread, and also um, uh, just trying to to basically make the worst straw man arguments you've ever heard in your life. Yeah. How do we start to combat that in a way that reaches the general public in a way that Dr. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson says is like, how do we reach people that don't know they like science or or know that they don't like science or, or facts like that? Yeah, it was just, there's three steps, really. Um, one is first, obviously, call it out and document it. Don't just claim it, like prove it, like show, um, you know, show, don't tell, right? So um, so first document, call it out and document it. Don't let it slide. Um, th but that's not enough because what will happen is they'll, they'll keep doing the same thing. So you'll do that and they'll, then they'll complain that you're complaining. Oh, you call everybody a liar. And it's like, no, I actually, they're lying. I have documented evidence that they're lying. Uh, people need to get outraged at the lying and the manipulators, the people who are doing the dishonest and lazy thing. People need to turn on them and not complain about you complaining about them, right? So, like, like they should see the complaint, look at the evidence, and go, oh, you know what, you're right. That's that's un not unacceptable. And then, and so that leads to the third step, which is that we need more people. We need more popular support. Like, people need to get behind the callouts and say, like, this is not acceptable. And especially people in the field. Uh, so, like, pe more and more people need to say that that is not acceptable. We should not be allowing this in our field. Um, we, you know, this is not the correct way to behave as a scholar. This is not the way to have these arguments. We need more authorities to actually publicly say this and actually shame it, like shame it down. Like don't allow this to be a, a standard operating procedure. And then, uh, you know, another step to that is people who aren't experts, but who, who are seen as authorities, uh, people who have a lot of influence, they need to get behind this too. And so you like talking about science, we need more people who aren't scientists, but pe people whose opinions the audience's respect to say you need to pay more attention to science or you need to like check out the scientific stuff like but don't fall for this quackery and so on so we need more people in positions of authority and influence to actually stand up for the correct way of doing this and to stand against vocally stand against when these tactics are used so that the tactics are no longer popular they can't be they can't succeed because they're immediately shamed and shut down and so that that's the only way to get rid of it. Otherwise, if we just keep defending these people or ignoring them and, and allowing them to continue doing it, they'll just keep doing it. They're, it's like Donald Trump, like you can't, like he just won't stop lying, right? So you, you, no matter how much you call him out or prove it, he just keeps doing it. And until people like start to notice that and admit that that's what's happening, 
it'll work like the, the constant lying and rhetoric will keep working because people will just believe him because he's Donald Trump and not actually critically examine it. And so we need more authorities that people respect to tell people to think critically and actually respond against and denounce these kinds of invalid ways to react to difficult claims. So, uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that you guys at home are are really enjoying today's interview. Uh, my interview guest so far today has been Dr. Richard Carrier, historian and philosopher. Uh, we are talking about many different subjects. We opened up kind of wide range, and we're now final finally bottlenecking to what you all came here to hear about: <laughs> the historicity right. of Jesus on the historicity of Jesus by Dr. Richard Carrier. So, yeah. Dr. Carrier, go ahead and take it away. What right. can what did you do in your studying? that in your studies for six years that has convinced seemingly convinced you that you are now a mythicist and you can explain what that means as well right. and then also on the historicity of jesus go ahead yeah why is it doubtable that's the question right um uh, it, it, i used to think like before i went through this study i used to think um that we had as good as a good of a historical basis for believing that it was at least a guy right um yeah he wasn't supernatural he wasn't the son of god he didn't perform miracles but he could have been a guru he could have been an apocalyptic prophetic figure and so on. there's lots of like completely plausible and i still think they're plausible accounts of the historical jesus uh and i you know i just assumed because that's what all the mainstream scholars were telling me uh that we have enough evidence to believe this the methodology holds up don't worry about it uh, but when I checked, I found that that's not the case, right? Uh, all these claims to evidence fall apart when you really look at them. And I think there's been sort of an institutional inertia. A lot of it's driven by faith belief and or even a willingness, or a, an unwillingness to challenge uh, colleagues who have faith beliefs, right? So there's this kind of need to be diplomatic about uh, your criticism or, or um, uh, critical analysis of religion. So, so this gets in the way. And I think uh, it's led to a lot of like things that keep getting said but when you check them out, they aren't actually true. They're just things that kept being repeated in the field. Um, one of the examples is the, the Q argument, for example, that this idea that, that we have uh, have uh, a document that, that was originally in Aramaic, that re firsthand record of the sayings of Jesus. We don't have that. We can't reconstruct it. We have no evidence that there was ever, ever any such thing. Um, and so it, but they'll just insist that you, oh yes, you follow this procedure, you can get there. And it's like, no, the procedure is illogical. Uh, it doesn't work on any other source texts in any other field. Uh, this is this is bogus, really. There's no basis for it. Uh, and and so, but you'll get this really elaborate argument for how we have the Q document really proves the historicity of Jesus. It's like there is no Q document. You made that up, right? So it's 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 that kind of thing that's a problem when you go looking at it. And then you know, then they'll start step back and admit, okay, yeah, we admit we don't have it. It's hypothetical, but we have good arguments for it. And then you go another step and kind of those arguments actually aren't, actually aren't very good. Uh, and when you do this, you keep poking at the threads, you're pulling at the threads, you get to the bottom, there's nothing left, which is a problem. Um, but the bigger problem, the kind of thing that tips it over is that when you look at the earliest documents we have, which a lot of people don't realize are the letters of Paul, or I should say half the letters of Paul, the other half mainstream scholars all agree are forgeries. They weren't written by Paul or even in his lifetime. Um, but the, but the, the seven authentics, the, the letters that we do think Paul actually wrote, that's our earliest literature. We have nothing even within 10 or 20 years of those, uh, the exception being possibly First Clement and the book of Hebrews are the only two things that might date to the same rough time as Paul. And, but even those two books, if you add Hebrews, First Clement and the seven authentics of Paul, if, if that's all we had, if we didn't have the Gospels, if we didn't have people repeating what the Gospels said later, if all we had were those letters that I just mentioned, we wouldn't be confident that Jesus was ever a person because those letters never mention Jesus being an actual person walking around. They only mention him as a revelatory being that people met and had conversations with in dreams or visions. Right. So that's Paul says, you know, the Gospel is only known, the Gospel and the Kerygma, the teaching of Christ is only known by revelation. Uh, and scripture. Uh, and and he does this several times. He talks about how the gospel is known by revelation and not not by any other means. So, uh, and there's never references a ministry. When you look at like 1 Corinthians 15, you know, like people read that with the dogmatic faith assumptions, but when you read it, you know, independently for itself, it says that the Jesus is his crucifixion, his atonement and, and resurrection and everything are known by scripture. And then people saw him. There's no reference to anyone seeing him as a person before that, anyone meeting Jesus before his death. 
it's the post resurrection appearances, the visions, the dreams. That's it. That's so when you read this as it is, it's saying that like this is just a cosmic being who whatever death and resurrection, whatever incarnation death and resurrection he underwent, appears to have happened somewhere where people couldn't witness it and was only learned about after the fact through visions and revelations. So Jesus is more like Moroni for for Mormonism or the angel Gabriel for Islam, where both of those religions claim that all of their teachings were preached by these angels, the Moroni in one case and, and Gabriel in the other, and they were preached in a revelation and then they wrote them down. Uh, and it looks very strongly like that's how Christianity actually began. It began with this angelic figure, the Jesus Christ figure, speaking to them in visions, giving them the gospel and the teachings that way, just like Moroni and Gabriel. And then decades later, that was allegorized into a story about a preacher in Galilee, right? And this has a lot of plausibility because all the other savior cults around the time that, that Christianity is an emulation of did the exact same thing. They all have non-existent savior figures about whom stories were invented, placing them in history, having them walk around and do miracles and give teachings and stuff that are completely false. There was no such person. There was no Osiris. That he, so Osiris was never a pharaoh of Egypt, but he had gospels written about him, essentially the equivalent of gospels about him being on earth, being a pharaoh, uh, undergoing tribulations, being murdered, uh, rising from the dead and defeating, defeating death. And so like all of these things. Uh, and you can see the same thing for Romulus uh, and for uh, for savior cults in particular. You've got the Bacchus cult and uh, Hercules Melkart, and there's all these different uh, religions. Inanna cult is another one. Uh, there's a lot of these savior cults that did the same thing. They have this celestial deity who didn't exist that they put into stories, putting them on Earth uh, with an Earth history. And so uh, it totally makes sense that Christianity would do the same thing in context. We should not be surprised that that happened because that was happening to all of these savior religions. Uh, and so that's what I think when you look at the evidence, the evidence fits this pattern better uh, than it fits all of the other attempts to sort of argue that Jesus was some sort of apocalyptic prophet who inspired people to imagine that he was risen from the dead, et cetera. Um, now, I don't think that that alternative, that the historical Jesus theory, it, the, the mainstream secular one that's he's not a miraculous guy, I don't think that's impossible. I don't think we have a smoking gun that can say it's absolutely there was no such guy. I, I give a highest probability of one in three, which is actually kind of respectable. Uh, so I think it's entirely plausible that there was a historical Jesus. But I just think the scale of probability, the balance of probability tips a little bit against it. Uh, and so I, I think we need to be honest about that and admit that. Uh, and that's what my book was about was showing like you can make a mainstream completely evidence-based logical argument for what I just said. Uh, and that needs to be acknowledged and, and appreciated. And I think that's, that's starting to be, be the case. I find that like the more and more, if they find a historian who actually like sits down and reads my book, they'll come out saying either that it's plausible uh, or even admit that they're a historicity agnostic. Uh, and I've got a list of them on my website. Uh, if you go to uh, my website, richardcarrier.info, search for Bart Ehrman recap, and then item 22, I number the items there. Item 22, I keep expanding every time I have a historian on the public record saying that it's plausible uh, or that they're agnostic or even a doubter. Um, I list them with evidence and stuff. So and it's now up to 20 scholars with full PhD, relevant PhD credentials on that list. Uh, it you know, started at about four or five of us. Now it's 20 or so. Uh, I expect it to continue growing. Um, because as, as when people get exposed to this and they start to, you know, pick at the threads, they realize the case is very weak for the historicity of Jesus. One thing that I'm wondering, and I didn't hear you mention this, because you, you said there's not a smoking gun that said that that, that right. man did not exist or this character did not exist. Yeah. But I was wondering, um, have you looked into like Caesar's Messiah? I was wondering to get your thoughts on like right. Messiah and Romans basically making this up and and it, in, in an attempt to uh, separate themselves from the Jewish religion the, the in the Torah that had this this main God in the sky character and they needed to take over lands and they noticed that that the easiest way to do that also was to force a said religion upon people but they couldn't steal the Torah so I'm wondering if if that has any any weight to it or if it's just like you're saying where there's no smoking gun where we really can't leak them up i'm, I'm curious to yeah no i 
I think that's a terrible argument. Um, there's a reason why that particular version of mythicism has never passed peer review. Uh, it doesn't hold up. It's it's a conspiracy based theory that is that leans on a lot of really bad scholarship and illogical inferences. So so no, I, I don't think that holds up. And I, I have an article on my blog site about that. So richardcarrier.info, if you look for at will, because uh, you're talking about Joseph at will, Caesar's Messiah. At Will's cranked up Jesus, and I have an article there about why this is crankery and not legitimate scholarship. Which is the thing that kept me distracted for the because I used to think that was the only case there was, right? That that all of the attacks, all the criticism of the historicity of Jesus, I thought it was all like that. It was all this sort of ridiculous, easily debunked amateurism. Uh, and so it was only when I actually seriously spent time researching this as a project as a scholar with a PhD in the field where I've got the training and everything and trying to meet the peer reviewed standards in the field. It was only when I did that, that I realized that there was a case to be made that didn't rely on all of those amateur crank arguments. And so, um, so I, I highly recommend people like be very skeptical of mythicism on the internet because there's a lot of uh, bad stuff that's not, not well-founded uh, up there. And, and a lot of, there's a lot of books that are not published by peer reviewed presses don't meet high standards of scholarship. So you got to be wary of those. But just because there's a bunch of bogus mythicism out there doesn't mean that there isn't something that's defensible as well. It, it That requires uh, actually figuring out how to separate the wheat from the chaff, as they say. Before we wrap up, I wanted to ask, what are some resources that you would give? Because I have a good friend named Ewart who is a huge fan of yours and um, would love to see what your suggestions are other than your website, which don't worry guys, any social media of Dr. Carrier's, uh, his website, all of those links will be down in the description box below, uh, along with his recommendations that he's about to give. <laughs> what recommendations uh, as far as looking up on the historicity of Jesus outside of yourself, like you were saying earlier, would you suggest mm -hmm. for someone like you or who really wants to, to dive into this? So Raphael Lataster's book, um, I can't remember the exact title off the top of my head. Um, I think it's Questioning the Historicity of Jesus or something to that effect. Um, now that's, unfortunately, it's a high-end academic monograph, so it's super expensive. Um, I would recommend, if you really want to read it, uh, go to the local public library and order it on interlibrary loan. Uh, so if, if in most countries, even the U.S., which, which doesn't have a lot of social services. Uh, even the US has libraries, public libraries that will do this for free or for a nominal fee. They'll, they'll find it anywhere in the world and have it shipped to the library. And you could borrow it like any other library book. So interlibrary loan, talk to a reference librarian and, and get Raphael Ataster's book. Uh, if you're not, if you want to read more from a perspective other than mine, right? So On the Historicity of Jesus is, of course, still the definitive book on this. Um, and what Lataster does is compare my book with competing uh, responses. So like Bart Ehrman's and Maurice Casey, for example. Uh, and so, and that's another, so that would be one other resource besides my book uh, and my website. Um, other than that, it depends on which specific issue because there's no, there's no general treatment of this subject uh, in peer reviewed monographs at all, uh, besides Latasters and mine. Um, so that, like pro or con, right? So that, that, that's all there is. Uh, you have to go back like a hundred years to find anything else. And that's super obsolete uh, by the time you're doing that. Um, so, so the question is like, you could pick specific issues. So like I'd mentioned the Q debate uh, and then I would have recommendations there. You've got to read uh, Mark Goodacre's, uh, obviously the case against Q, but also his latest, he's got a, a latest book on the synoptics. That's, that's really important. Uh, but you'd pick a specific question in here and then, then, there, then there'd be a different list of things to look at uh, for that. So Gerd Ludemann is a really good author to look for, to understand uh, why we should be skeptical of the claims, the apologetics claims made about the letters of Paul, for instance. Ludemann is not a mythicist. He doesn't think that Jesus didn't exist. He, he believes that there's a historical Jesus. But he does good, sound, critical analysis of the letters of Paul and says there's a lot of this stuff we shouldn't be interpreting the way that faith faith claims have been interpreting it. Uh, a lot of this we should be taking with a grain of salt. He, so he, he treats the letters of Paul in a way that's more skeptical. So Ludeman's a good author for that purpose, uh, even though like he's not going to agree with me on everything and I'm not going to agree with him on everything. It's at least that's a place to look, for example. So it would depend on the specific question. And, and to an extent, that's kind of what my book does up to 2014. If I think there's something important on this, it will be cited in the footnotes of the book. Um, so that's a good place to go finding your rabbit holes. 
you know, find the claim that you want to dig into, and I'll either cite like primary evidence, like the the works of Philo. You can find a translation of that uh, by Yonga, for example. There's a big 800-page volume of all the works, all the surviving works of Philo of Alexandria. You can go look at it yourself, right? Uh, or if there's certain scholars to look at uh, that that have done uh, different things on vision science, for instance, and uh, things of that nature. I, I talk about cargo cults as an analogy. There's a whole rabbit hole to go down there. Uh, so for so it depends on the specific thing, I would say. And and like I said, the, the guide I, I intended on the history of Jesus to be a guide to that. Um, and in a few weeks, gosh, oh, it's only one week from from the day we're recording this. Uh, I'm going to be presenting a paper for um, the Society of Biblical Literature Conference and the Regional Conference in uh, Brea, California. Uh, so it's just a you know, 15 minute presentation uh, and where I'm going to be summarizing the state of peer reviewed scholarship on this question of the history of, of Jesus pro and con. Uh, that bibliography I, will end up online at somewhere, uh, but that would be like I would say the best bibli bibliography to pursue because it will include everything peer reviewed pro and con so you can see like the best arguments for and against and then you can compare them and see which ones like actually hold up uh and so that bibliography will will exist online somewhere well through my website for sure uh within a couple of weeks uh based on my talk in brea um and so so that's like the next thing that i think would probably be most relevant to what you're asking about and and the last thing i do and i do this with everyone is asking what what is the best way for people to get a hold of you other than your website uh, on social media, if they like to follow you at least on social media, uh, what are the best ways? So, um, so I do two different things. So Twitter, I only use for announcements. So if all you want to know is that I'm going to appear on a show like yours or uh, appear publicly somewhere, or I've published an article, uh, if all you want are my announcements of things that have happened that are relevant to my work, um, Twitter, follow Twitter. That's, that's all that happens there. I put nothing else on Twitter except those things. Um, Facebook, I do that as well. So you can follow me on Facebook. I don't have room for more friends, but you, you can click follow instead of friend. Uh, if you follow me on Facebook, uh, you'll get all the same stuff plus random thoughts about things. So I'll, I'll talk about politics, art, and other things, sort of like mini blogging in a sense. Um, so you get a little bit more than just announcements. You'll get a little bit more of my, my you know, intellectual thoughts about things. Um, and then, of course, my blog, that's my serious article uh, engine. So I have pe my Patreon supporters are essentially funding the writing of four substantial blogs a month in both contemporary philosophy, ancient history and, and origins of Christianity, uh, a lot of Jesus historicity stuff. Uh, and those are substantial, lengthy, carefully written, carefully researched articles. Uh, and so you can also subscribe to my blog. And uh, there's an option to do that on my blog. And then you'll just get the notices of the blog articles that come out. Uh, and it, I also put on my blog physical in-person appearances. So if I'm actually going to physically be somewhere, uh, those also end up being reported on my blog. But I don't report uh, video like this or podcasts and things there. Um, to get that, you have to follow my Twitter or Facebook feeds. Thank you so much, Dr. Carrier. And and I wanted to say, so as we wrap up, of course, I'm your host, Pat Voss, for the Golden Knowledge Podcast. My guest today, esteemed guest, uh, on the historicity of Jesus and more, we talked about a lot of it kind of not necessarily debunking the whole Bible, but really showing, maybe poking holes a little bit in what people think are, are concrete walls. And um, yeah. And, and yeah. today's guest was historian and philosopher, uh, Dr. Richard Carrier. Dr. Carrier, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Absolutely. And like I said, I'm Pat Voss, host of the Gold Knowledge Podcast. We will see you next week for another great episode. Stay tuned.